Chapter Five, Part One of Letters on an Elk Hunt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Carroll. Letters on an Elk Hunt by Eleanor Pruitt Stewart. Chapter Five, Part One. Daniel and His Mother. In Camp on the Grovant, September 6, 1914. My dear friend, I have neglected you for almost a week, but when you read this letter and learn why, I feel sure you will forgive me. To begin with, we bade Mrs. Mortimer goodbye and started out to find better fishing than the pretty little stream we were on afforded us. Our way lay up Green River and we were getting nearer our final campground all the time, but we were in no hurry to begin hunting, so we were just loitering along. There were a great many little lakes along the valley and thousands of duck. Mr. Stewart was driving, but as he wanted to shoot ducks, I took the lines and drove along. There is so much that is beautiful, and I was trying so hard to see it all that I took the wrong road. But none of us noticed it at first, and then we didn't think it worth while to turn back. The road we were on had lain along the foothills, but when I first thought I had missed the right road, we were coming down into a grassy valley. Mr. Stewart came across a marshy stretch of meadow and climbed up on the wagon. The ground was more level, and on every side were marshes and pools. The willows grew higher here so that we couldn't see far ahead. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy was behind, and she called out, Say, I believe we are off the road. Elizabeth said she had noticed a road winding off on our right, so we agreed that I must have taken the wrong one, but as we couldn't turn in the willows, we had to go on. Soon we reached higher, drier ground and passed through a yellow grove of quaking asp. A man came along with an axe on his shoulder, and Mr. Stewart asked him about the road. Yes, he said, you are off the main road, but on a better. You'll cross the same stream you were going to camp on, right at my ranch. It is just a little way across here, and it's almost sundown, so I will show you the way. He strode along ahead. We drove through an avenue of great dark pines and across a log bridge that spanned a noisy, brawling stream. The man opened a set of bars and we drove into a big, clean corral. Comfortable sheds and stables lined one side and big stacks of hay were conveniently placed. He began to help unharness the teams saying that they might just as well run in his meadow as he was through haying. Then the horses would be safe while we fished. He insisted on our stopping in his cabin, which we found to be a comfortable two-room affair with a veranda the whole length. The biggest pines overshadowed the house. Just behind it was a garden in which some late vegetables were still growing. The air was rather frosty, and some worried hens were trying hard to cover some chirping half-feathered chicks. It was such a homey place that we felt welcome and perfectly comfortable at once. The inside of the house will not be hard to describe. It was clean as could be, but with a typical bachelor's cleanliness. There was no dirt, but a great deal of disorder. Across the head of the iron bed was hung a miscellany of socks, neckties, and suspenders. A discouraging assortment of boots, shoes, and leggings protruded from beneath the bed. Some calendars ornamented the wall, and upon a table stood a smoky lamp and some tobacco and a smelly pipe. On a rack over the door lay a rifle. Pretty soon our host came bustling in and exclaimed, the kitchen is more pleasant than this room, and there's a fire there, too. Then, catching sight of his lamp, he picked it up hurriedly and said, Just as sure as I leave anything undone, 
that sure somebody comes and sees how slouchy I am. Come on into the kitchen where you can warm and I'll clean this lamp. One of the cows was sick this morning. I hurried over things so as to doctor her, and I forgot the lamp. I smoke and the lamp smokes to keep me company. The kitchen would have delighted the heart of anyone. Two great windows, one in the east and one in the south, gave plenty of sunlight, a shining new range and a fine assortment of vessels, which were not all yet in their place, were in one corner. There was a slow ticking clock up on a high shelf. Near the door stood a homemade washstand with a tin basin, and above it hung a long narrow mirror. On the back of the door was a towel rack. The floor was made of white pine and was spotlessly clean. In the center of the room stood the table with a cover of red oilcloth. Some chairs were placed about the table, but our host quickly hauled them out for us. He opened his storeroom and told us to dish in dirty face and help ourselves to anything we wanted because we were to be his somebody come for that night. Then he hurried out to help with the teams again. He was so friendly and so likable that we didn't feel a bit backward about dishing in, and it was not long before we had a smoking supper on the table. While we were at supper, he said, I wonder now if any of you women can make aprons and bonnets. I don't mean them dinky little things like they make now, but rail-wearing things like they used to make. I was afraid of another advertisement romance and didn't reply, but Mrs. O'Shaughnessy said, Indeed we can, none better. Then he answered, I want a blue chambray bonnet and a bunch of aprons made for my mother. She is on the way here from Pennsylvania. I ain't seen her for fifteen years. I left home longer than that ago, but I remember everything, just how everything looked and I'd like to have things inside the house as nearly like home as I can, anyway. I didn't know how long we could stop there, so I still made no promises, but Mrs. O'Shaughnessy could easily answer every question for a dozen women. Have you the cloth? she asked. Yes, he said. He had had it for a long time, but he had not had it sewn because he had not been sure Mother could come. "'What's your name?' asked Mrs. O'Shaughnessy. He hesitated a moment, then said, "'Daniel Holt.' I wondered why he hesitated, but forgot all about it when Clyde said we would stop there for a few days if he wanted to help Mr. Holt. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy's mind was already made up. Elizabeth said she would be glad to help, and I was not long in deciding when Daniel said, I'll take it as a rail friendly favor if you women could help, because Mother ain't had what could rightly be called a home since I left home. She's crippled, too, and I want to do all I can. I know she'd just like to have some aprons and a sunbonnet. His eyes had such a pathetic, appealing look that I was ashamed, and we at once began planning our work. Daniel helped with the dishes and, as soon as they were done, brought out his cloth. He had a heap of it, a bolt of checked gingham, enough blue chambray for half a dozen bonnets, and a great many remnants, which he said he had bought from peddlers from time to time. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy selected what she said we would begin on and dampened it so as to shrink it by morning. We then spread our beds and made ready for an early start next day. Next morning we ate breakfast by the light of the lamp that smoked for the sake of companionship and then started to cut out our work. Daniel and Mr. Stewart went fishing and we packed their lunch so as to have them out of the way all day. I undertook the making of the bonnet because I knew how and because I can remember the kind my mother wore. I reckon Daniel's mother would have worn about the same style. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy and Elizabeth can both cross-stitch, so they went out to Daniel's granary and ripped up some grain bags, 
in order to get the thread with which they were sewed to work one apron in cross-stitch. But when we were ready to sew, we were dismayed, for there was no machine. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy, however, was of the opinion that someone in the country must have a sewing machine, so she saddled a horse and went out, she said, to beat the brush. She was hardly out of sight before a man rode up and said there had been a telephone message saying that Mrs. Holt had arrived in Rock Springs and was on her way as far as New Fork in an automobile. That threw Elizabeth and myself into a panic. We posted the messenger off on a hunt for Daniel. Elizabeth soon got over her flurry and went at her cross-stitching. I hardly knew what to do, but acting from force of habit, I reckon, I began cleaning. A powerfully good way to reason out things sometimes is to work, and just then I had to work. I began on the storeroom, which was well lighted and which was also used as a pantry. As soon as I began straightening up, I began to wonder where the mother would sleep. By arranging things in the storeroom a little differently, I was able to make room for a bed and a trunk. I decided on putting Daniel there. So then I began work in earnest. Elizabeth laid down her work and helped me. We tacked white cheesecloth over the wall, and although the floor was clean, we scrubbed it to freshen it. We polished the window until it sparkled. We were right in the middle of our work when Mrs. O'Shaughnessy came, and Daniel with her. They were all excitement, but Mrs. O'Shaughnessy is a real general, and soon marshaled her forces. Daniel had to go to New Fork after his mother. That would take three days. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy pointed out to him the need of a few pieces of furniture, so he took a wagon and team, which he got a neighbor to drive, while he took another team and a buggy for his mother. New Fork is a day's drive beyond Pinedale, and the necessary furniture could be had in Pinedale. So the neighbor went along and brought back a new bed, a rocker, and some rugs. But, of course, he had to stay overnight. I was for keeping right on house cleaning, but as Mrs. O'Shaughnessy had arranged for us all to come and sew that afternoon at a nearby house, we took our sewing and clambered into the buckboard and set out. End of chapter 5, part 1